So if you're so heavily stressed, even though your diet's perfect, your nutrition's perfect, your sleep's perfect, but your stress is off the chart, it's just going to be impacting you just as much. So it's really important to like understand the kind of interlink between all of these factors. And the the first place I always say is like start with your environment, mm. because all of these different things that we talk about, all of our different pillars of health, even sleep, if our environment is not set up to support that you're adding like another friction to that behavior and it's so hard for you to do it and we know how hard it is to ingrain a habit like a lot of us think about how hard is it to ingrain a habit we all know we floss we probably don't floss because it's not become a habit and so it's like what can we do to reduce that friction to it becoming a normalized habit trying to go to bed earlier we all know that but we don't do it and what is the friction that's stopping it is it the amount of phones is that we know we've got access we can put the tv on at any point can we have apps that shut our phone down so we actually can't go on our phone even if we try to go on it we can't open these apps like what is it that we can start to do to start improving our health behaviors and and the first kind of common denominator in all of it is is our environment. So Sarah Ann Macklin, welcome to the Your Body's Way podcast. This is a really, really special episode today because not only are you a super special guest, but we're also <laughs> going to be discussing um, a really important topic today, um, which is mental health and how our lifestyle and how our food choices can support our mental health because mental health is what you do. It's your, um, it's what you base your, um, you know, your business around. And it's, it's basically what you do. It's, this is your vibe. So um, I can't wait to dig into it with you. So a big, big welcome. How are you doing today? Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm very excited to have this conversation on all the topics that I love. Um, so hopefully the listeners enjoy them too. And uh, I'm good. I'm good. I've had a I've had a hectic week, um, mm. which I'm not complaining about, but I am very excited. It's near the weekends. So <laughs> I'm I'm doing good. But I had a we had our big event yesterday and um they're always like quite energy draining afterwards, but you mm. also feel this huge spur of energy at the same time because you've had so much kind of connection to others. So, right. so yeah, I think I'm still kind of energetically high from yesterday, which is amazing. Quite nice. And what event was that? Was that for the Be Well Collective? It was, yes. Yeah, so one of my companies that I run is a mental health organization called the Be Well Collective, which mm-hmm. has been going for about five years now. And um, we always do two big, large events every year um, around Mental Health Awareness Week and a Mental Health Awareness Day. Um, and Mental Health Awareness Day was last week. So we kind of did a, a big event around that as well. And we have workshops with different speakers and seminars and goodie bags. And um, and a lot of it is about kind of bringing together a safe community that's connected and it being in the right tribe. And I speak a lot about that in my seven pillars, but you know, making sure you've got human connection in the right tribe is kind of essential to any health to change or behavior that you want to do um you know you obviously live in the beautiful Cayman Islands and so you're surrounded by I can imagine a lot of nature and things Mm -hmm. but it's also like not just that it's about like who are you around who are you influencing who's influencing you and all those kind of things have a massive impact on just kind of our our day-to-day life so it was really nice yesterday that everyone felt in a very safe space I think I craved that for a very long time I struggled to find a tribe yes. um, that I related to that encouraged those health behaviors yes. um, so yeah so it was a really nice space yesterday to, uh, to be Lovely. involved in and what I love about the way you put yourself out there is you don't just put yourself out there to Um, talk about other people you're also very open about your own journey which I can't wait to go into with you because I think you know myself I want to know more and my listeners would really benefit from knowing your journey as well because um, I have to say when I was looking into your um, when I was looking into your work it was um, really good fun first of all like looking into (laughs) everything you do is just um, it's really inspiring and um, I have to say I watched your 2017 TED talk about um I think the title was our models role models or something mm-hmm. similar to that and um do you know what when after I watched that TED talk I felt so light and so inspired because I needed that talk more than I ever thought I did because wow. that morning um I the usual thoughts going through my head like I was kind of reeling about you know comparison and 
you know, oh, mm. this person's doing more and, you know, why don't I put myself out there like this person and this person, like just comparison, compa- um, yeah. comparisons and comparing and Instagram and social media. And um, like, I was just caught up in it that morning and watching your TED talk, I just felt this release. I was just like, oh, do you know what? If if Sarah Ann Macklin, if she struggles with these things and she's talking about oh, how man, we're yeah. all struggling with the same thing, then I'm okay. Like there's nothing wrong with me. And mm-hmm. I that was that was a really lovely moment for me. I have there to say. is I'm so glad that that touched you in that way. Yeah. Cause there is definitely nothing wrong with you. Um, let me first of all say yeah. that. Absolutely at all. <laughs> um, you're totally putting yourself out there. You've got a podcast. Right. Um, so you're definitely steps way more steps ahead than probably many people mm. on that side of things. Even kind of speaking on a show can be really terrifying and doing yeah. it yourself is terrifying. So I think, yeah. you know, that's something that you should remember. We always think about things we haven't got, but we forget what we've actually built, which is yes. which yes. is really, really important. Um, exactly. But social comparison is the worst. And I think anyone listening to this, actually, I know everyone listening to this will have some point of social comparison in Always. their lives, whether it's on social media, within their friendship group, or whatever it is. You know, it's such a big part. We always see the the world through rose tinted glasses, mm. even though we aren't always consciously aware that we're doing that. We're always aware of things that we don't have. And as I said to you, we're very very unaware of like giving ourselves kind of a pat on the back on like what have we done Mm -hmm. and I think what's really important like as we kind of get to the end of the year this is the time when I actually like to write down like what are the changes that I have made this year because we kind of just go along through our day and through our lives and through our years without ever kind of looking back on actually how far we have come and I imagine if you write your last five years down I mean one you sound like you've changed country but you also sound like you've probably done a whole load of things in those five Mm -hmm. years and we kind of forget all of those steps because we're always striving for the next and so it's so important just for kind of our own personal development and anything Mm -hmm. that we do that we actually acknowledge what we have done um not what we haven't done it's really really critical and it's such a big part of our mental health because there's really kind of famous knowledge around kind of the equilibrium of how we speak to ourselves and Mm -hmm. for every negative comment that we tell ourselves we need three positive comments to balance that out and so if we're constantly telling ourselves I'm not good enough or I haven't done this well enough or this person's doing way better than me or why am I not putting myself out there like this person is or why didn't I record this many videos or why have I not got promotion like my friend you know Lisa's got that all of these things are constantly putting ourselves down and it's like could you imagine going home to your partner and that's all your partner says to you yeah you would feel so shut down but that's the narrative that we do tell ourselves every day Mm -hmm. and so it's so important that every time we realize that voice is coming in is to react with three positive ones well actually you know I haven't gone for that promotion because of x y and z and I haven't done this because these are things that I've been doing yeah and it's actually really important to do that because otherwise fear becomes this massive thing that we don't move forward because we just tell ourselves that we're not good enough so it is really essential to to it's it's human nature we are going to compare ourselves we can't go through the rest of our lives going well that's it now I'm never going to compare myself ever again because that's also just not reality like we are bombarded by things to make us compare yeah. ourselves like Instagram is literally made for us to feel terrible about right. ourselves <laughs> and so it's like we're gonna always compare ourselves and I was at the epicenter of that in the modeling industry where all I did was compare myself 24 7 because that was kind of yeah. what I made my money from yeah but yeah. what I've come to realize is that's the most detrimental thing that we can do to for ourselves and it's a form of self-sabotage so yeah. we're yeah. gonna do it but it's just like remind ourselves that that's one lens that you're looking through. There's a whole other story there that you're not seeing. Yeah. And that person's probably really struggled to get where they've got to. Mm-hmm. You know, lots of people talk about kind of success, but you very rarely see like the other side of all the failings that they've had to get to that place. So, yeah, it's really important to remind yourself. Yeah. And also realizing, like really realizing that you're not alone. Because when we're inside our heads, mm. it's so easy to feel like our problem is slightly different from everybody else's we're like well Mm -hmm. we all struggle with these things but me I really this is really a problem like this is Mm -hmm. this is um you know I I don't know how people would cope with how I feel because you know this feels really bad and everyone else looks so good from the outside everyone looks like they're getting on with life and I think really embodying the knowledge that we are all the same and we are all experiencing the same emotions in the same depths as well Mm -hmm. and really Mm -hmm. really embodying that and realizing that you're totally normal and 
you're not alone and everyone feels the same and we're all together in this like sometimes that that's reassuring for me to feel when I'm feeling down I'm just like look you're really not alone like honestly and when I really embody that it really sinks in and sometimes it helps totally I think it's also like not being scared of those emotions like Mm -hmm. you know sadness anger fear frustration all of these things kind of come up and we 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 have kind of been taught wrongly to look at them in a bad way or well when to be honest we're not even taught anything we're not taught anything about emotions I'll just start there and that's the problem and so we don't know how to handle or cope with these and we all have them I mean it's part of like the human being we all have mm-hmm. emotions we don't all wake up I definitely do not wake up happy every day I definitely have to struggle with a mindset all the time mm-hmm. um and but it's something that it's like a continuous learning and actually you're allowed to have days when you feel like crap you're allowed to have days when you know that social comparison becomes a lot stronger and you're struggling to cope but it's like reminding yourselves that actually this is just part of being human and every single person that you're looking on through that lens will be going through those emotions and some people might have stronger emotions than others Mm -hmm. but they can also flip into kind of more higher states than others so I think it's really important to just be really aware of that and then when those emotions come it's like the biggest thing that you can do is just have compassion for yourself so we seem to kind of beat ourselves up that we feel like we we feel ashamed that we feel this way which is like I shouldn't feel this way yeah you shouldn't and it's about like just having compassion it's like okay that's how I feel and these are the reasons why and that is completely acceptable like of course I feel like that this makes complete sense and maybe it doesn't make complete sense but it's just having kind of compassion and not running away from it and not trying to hide it and mask it that's kind of the biggest thing and I think that's one of the things that we're not talking about we don't understand how to hold compassion for oneself and also just to kind of sit in that emotion because it feels so uncomfortable because they're not nice emotions to experience but when we can kind of like accept that nothing terrible is going to happen with that emotion and actually like labeling that emotion mm. it actually starts normalizing it a little bit more and going okay well today I actually feel really really angry or today I actually feel really really weak and sad mm. and I feel really really weak and sad because of these things and actually that and that's normalizing it and verbalizing it as opposed to making it feel like a very shameful stigmatized emotion that nobody mm. should feel so I think it's the more conversations we have around that and normalizing that is mm. so, so important. And I imagine you see that as a mum with kids, you know, where they're pretty going through massive amounts of frustration and they don't know why they're feeling that yes. way. And, and that's, that's a really okay. kind of like terrifying moment for a child. You know, they don't know why they're feeling it. And yeah. trying to explain that is really difficult because most adults don't know why they feel it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly and I think as a parent um you know I try and I try and shield them from those emotions when really I shouldn't I should let them have it you know let them you know run into these emotions and um you know get upset and cry and you know maybe even have this tantrum and just try and understand why they're having it rather than shielding them from it um mm-hmm. but again so that I mean that the fact that you encourage human connection and you you speak of the seven pillars of health I mean I'm going to go into who you are in a moment but just as we're speaking about this um you you talk about the seven pillars of health and how it helps your mental health so things like food sleep human connection and the list goes on for seven pillars and um, that's basically what you base your podcast around. It's what you base your, um, you know, the Be Well Collective around. And um, so I just think it's really fascinating. It's really empowering because you're basically telling people, look, um, I we understand that this is happening, but there are ways that you can um, take control and you can um, make things better for yourself. So that's what I love about what you do. And I just, um, that's why this is such a special episode. But um, first, I just wanted to um, go through uh, what you're known for. Um, If people don't already know who you are, which I'm sure many people do who are listening. Um, But let's let's start. So um, you're the host of a renowned podcast, the Live Well and Be Well podcast. And it's not short of celebrity guests. So guests such as Kimberly Wyatt from the Pussycat Dolls, David Walliams, Reggie Yates, Liz Earl. Um, So it's a brilliant podcast. I think it's been going for about seven or eight seasons now. We're about to go into season 12. 12. Oh my God, my research must have been, I must have been looking at something old. Apologies for that. 12 seasons. (laughs) Okay, right. That is a lot. Um, So you're the founder of the non-profit organization, the Be Well Collective, which is doing incredibly well. 
backed by the British Fashion Council, which I'm no model, but I imagine that's a very <laughs> big deal. Um, you're a public speaker, you're an author, um, international model, and you were voted Woman of the Year in 2017 by the high profile magazine, The Rake. Um, so my first question to you, Sarah, is how do you juggle all of these <laughs> exciting hats? How do you do it? I don't. I just put that out there. I don't. <laughs> I'm just being really serious. I don't care. Love it. <laughs> yes, I love it. Uh, I, I love mean, I'd the love reality to sit here of things. It's it's all such a breeze, <laughs> but it's not. I have crises every week. My poor partner has been in tears all the time. <laughs> but it's down to like my own detriment, I have to say. And I, mm. you know, I wouldn't have it any other way apart. I might not live to a hundred, but um, <laughs> you know, that's not what I'm advocating. But no, I mean, it's like it's interesting. Like when you kind of read like lists of what you've done. Sometimes we kind of like, might listen to that list and think, oh, wow, that's a lot. But that's kind of been boiling for 10 years. And I remember when I started, and I remember because I pivoted my whole career and I was an international model for, for 10 years at a very high profile and linking and, and pivoting into a completely different world and retraining as an expert, setting up a clinic, you know, starting to public speak publicly where all I was known as before was kind of how I photographed figuring out I had dyslexia through all of this so like my confidence was shot away I mean not only was I kind of a bit lower in confidence because you know within the modeling industry it's not the friendliest kind of industry to be in I was also riddled with anxiety of you know how would I come across how how do I how do I speak do I speak very well can I pronounce words properly my you know I can't do any of kind of like my pronunciations of my enzymes and biochemistry or pronunciations of words my phonics are everywhere and so I was like riddled with so much kind of anxiety to kind of get started. And, you know, as you said, I remember kind of going on this journey and seeing these kind of people at the top of their game and thinking, well, how am I going to get there? How am I ever going to get there? And what I didn't realize is they've been there for 20 years. And it's so important to like, when you look at anyone who's kind of kind of done anything in, in an industry, it's kind of like seeing that journey. And I think like now I'm in a, I've been doing this kind of now for eight years, kind of founded the BWR five years ago. The podcast has been going nonstop for three years. So we're in our 12 seasons. But I think a lot of it is figuring out what you love. I think I said this to you when I kind of came on and I'll like pre-chat, but so much about of it is if you're ever going to go off and do something on your own, you've got to love because you're going to live and breathe it. And what I figured out was that I was living and breathing health way before I started studying it and it's something that I just wanted to for myself understand and then the more that I started to kind of understand it and I started to realize my neurodivergent brain I started to figure out all of my strengths and weaknesses and there were so many barriers for me to starting a company or starting a podcast or public speaking but actually the more that I chucked myself in at the deep end I mean I think my first public speaking appearance appearance was European Parliament and I was like and How you said you had many breakdowns advising? beforehand. I had many, I saw breakdowns. That. I had many yeah. breakdowns. And like, I remember sitting on that train to Brussels with, you know, people that had been experts, like the head of the Royal College of Physicians. I was the only woman. I was about 25 years younger than anyone else. And there was four people on the panel. Three of them were men and one of them was me. And we were speaking to 2000 people of the government to change European dietary guidelines. And I just remember having complete panic attacks the whole time. But actually I look back at it now and I'm like, do you know what? I just chucked myself in at the deep end. Maybe didn't, I, mean, I think I did do quite a good job. I hope I did. But, you know, I probably left and thought, God, I probably sounded really anxious. But it's those moments where actually, I think I just chucked myself in. And what I've realized now is, after all of those kind of struggles, is I really love public speaking. <laughs> and mm. I never thought I would have said that because I think for years, when I was neurodivergent, I had no confidence, but actually understanding and being really kind to myself through my own journey and figuring out my strengths, and my weaknesses, storytelling, keynote mm. speaking, you know, community, like all of that kind of thing is actually what I enjoy. And so what I've ended up doing is leaning a lot of parts of my of, of my companies. I've kind of taken that leading role. I think when you start a company or any company, you try to, you have to do everything, but over time, you've got to start realizing that you can't do it all and that you've got to try and bring other people in to support you and I have so many weaknesses um and if I only focus on those weaknesses I wouldn't get anywhere um but try and focus on the strengths that I know that I'm good at 
is what's going to drive me and my my companies forward. Mm -hmm. So that's what I focus on. And then everything else I can't do. And I wish someone told me this 10 years ago (laughs) is to like find people that are really good at it because they're great at that. And that's why they're doing that job. And so I think that's kind of the key skill that I've learned is that when you are starting anything, you are doing it all. But yeah. as soon as you can, and you can start bringing in other people to help you, even if it's part of your family, you know, even if it's part of your family members to help you like type something up, or maybe you're a slow typer, or maybe you need proofreading, whatever it is, get other people involved who can help mm-hmm. you kind of spur you on. And then, you know, whenever you're doing anything on your own, having kind of people that support you is really, really key. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, I mean, there is definitely a lot going on um, with what we do now and what we run and and how many people that work with us. But I think I would not be honest if I didn't say I'm having a crisis every week still. Um, but I think everyone does. And, and I just don't think people does. talk about it. And exactly. And, and you know it drives I, me mad. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely. And you know what? I've had several crises this week already. And I'm sure that the person next door has had several crises. Like we've all, yeah. we're all going through it. We're all on the same journey, even though it feels different. But yeah. um, seeing as you're speaking about um, getting started and then from where you were to where you are now, um, this quote comes to mind and it's by Marie Forleo, which I'm a, I'm a huge fan of hers. And she basically says, um, mind the gap, which basically means when you start out at anything, whether you, you're training up as a nutritionist or whether you're you know starting a new business or, you know, in the beginning, yes, you you will be a bit questionable you know you mm-hmm. you won't be as great as the person that you're looking up to you do have that work to do and there is a gap but how long is that gap so let's say it's about five ten years in five or ten years you will be as good as you want to be as long as you work your way through you keep going and just mind that gap because in that gap there are going to be times when you're not happy with what you've done and I just really love that because it takes the pressure off and um, anybody who is starting something new or doing something scary, just knowing that um, not getting it perfect is completely acceptable. So I personally- It's where the best best things are made. That's where the best stuff happens, right? The most, you know, the podcast came out of a complete mistake. And I, (laughs) and so many things that I've gone on to do have all been made from mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I think we look at these perfect kind of parts on- I don't know it's YouTube or social media and we're like god they've just got it nailed mm. I mean they have not got it nailed. they've gone through so many mistakes to get there you just don't see it you now see like the polished version and I think that's what's so so important mm. you know if I look back at my podcast when I started it oh my gosh it was like I mean Same. it was awful but it was like not great <laughs> at all really? and you know I kind of and then now you know we've got a big team that works on the show but I kind of I would never have got to where I've got to without complete failings and learnings and, you know, working on systems where we didn't even have a microphone. I was just using the Mac computer, but I, I I started it. And I think so many people struggle to start something, myself included, and mm-hmm. I'm getting better at this, but we struggle to start something because we don't think we're good enough. Mm-hmm. We don't think we've got everything that we need and you don't need all this fancy equipment. You don't need yeah. a big team to get something started. You just need to start. And that is the biggest thing yeah you just need to start and if you don't start you'll actually never get there even in five years you'll never get there yeah it's all about those learnings and the reiterations and 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 the reiterations is when you see the biggest growth Mm. and so I kind of think that is one of the biggest things that I wish I knew earlier is don't let perfection hold you back just you just have to go for it um, right. and be curious and the biggest thing on any growth is is curiosity yeah. um, and people get very scared of change but that's when like the real magic happens when you're yeah. really uncomfortable that's actually when change happens and like really great things occur and that's really encouraging for anybody listening who um, is thinking about doing something that they're afraid of um, you know that that's a good sign it's a good sign that it's a great you sign do it get uncomfortable yes get uncomfortable yeah. I love that. I need to take that on more, to be honest. But, um, I but I know that to be true for sure. Yeah. So, um, I wanted to ask you more about mental health because um, your um, the Be Well Collective focuses on young people who are struggling, and and particularly young people, um, young creatives. 
um, maybe a lot of them are from the modeling industry, I can imagine, um, because you're, you yourself, I mean, you know, you are, I'll say, um, you know, what we've already said, um, you're, you're an international model working for the biggest brands and you decided to take a leap and retrain as a nutritionist. It was a literal, literal leap. I was mad. Like, <laughs> you were... I was mad. I went from like a massive multi-paying industry into yeah. something that didn't pay you anything. Right. <laughs> I mean, exactly. And no one, exactly. And no one knew what a nutritionist yeah. was. I was and I bonkers. think it was, it was probably, it was, I think you said it was your mum or your dad or someone was just like, um, are you sure about this? Like it was this yeah, kind Everyone of like... questioned me for about right. six months. Right. Yeah. So um, basically, um, you bring that to the forefront of what you do. Um, so what I wanted to know is, why do you think we're struggling with mental health issues um, and feelings of loneliness, let's say, more than ever? Why is this happening right now? Like, I feel like it's everywhere. It is. Do you know what? I did a talk. I did a talk last week. Um, it was around performance. And we went out for dinner afterwards with the person whose company it was and and some of the employees and and he said to me you know I feel like anxiety is just a thing everyone's in, everyone's mm. anxious and he was you know probably in his 60s and he was like you know my day this just wasn't a thing and it was interesting because I kind of had to say well I actually completely acknowledge what he says because I could you know I remember my parents my parents would say well neurodiversity wasn't a thing when mm. we were at school and or anxiety wasn't a thing but you know you have to kind of take it back and you go well it was it just wasn't spoken about um and that's one of the biggest things like actually now we are becoming really aware of our mental health we're becoming really aware and mental health i think it really needs to be redefined because it's basically your brain health mental health doesn't mean that you are ill mm -hmm. but you will become ill unless you look after your mental health your muscles will start to degrade and waste away unless you feed them and look after them and 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 stretch them and train them like that is why your muscles are there to protect your bones and unless we like look after those they actually you know they will kind of start having tears in and they will wilt away and they won't be there as a kind of effective barrier to our, to our bones and that's how we need to look at our brain and so mental health is a really encompassing term everyone suffers with mental health yes mental health disease or a mental health kind of um disorder is completely different mm -hmm. and that means when you're diagnosed with something like psychosis or depression or whatever that is but that doesn't mean that's also a label for you because you can also really help support that and have a very normal living life. And so I think there's something that people really get scared of, especially within um, the UK, let's say within America, around the term of mental health, because all of a sudden it feels very stigmatized mm -hmm. and people are going to be labeled. And I think that's where we've got a real problem in society still. I know it's getting better, but I, I still see it all the time and stuff that I do day in, day out, that it's still stigmatized. And so I think we need to start like really stepping away from like labeling and actually just talk about it as a really encompassing term, because that's actually when we're going to start looking at it. Nobody stigmatizes you for going to the gym and looking after your body because that's totally acceptable. Right. But for some reason, people will still feel very heavily stigmatized and we talk about therapy mm -hmm. or we talk about like, how can we improve our mental health? Or I'm really suffering at the moment with my mental health. All of a sudden that becomes very stigmatized and, and, it, and it shouldn't be and that can be a massive barrier to people actually getting the health the health care or the access that they need mm -hmm. um and that's what i think was happening 50 years ago you know people felt such a barrier to entry that everybody just masked how they felt and there is you know garba mate who speaks a lot about kind of stress within the body and how that manifests into disease um there's a lot of that things, you know, a lot of a lot of the things that we're dying from are preventable. And I really believe stress is one of the biggest factors that is killing us in society. And that is linked to mental health. Like if we had a good mental health, we would not be so stressed. And yes, our environment causes a huge drive into this. So it's not just one factor and it's very multifactorial when we look at this. But overall, today, we spend 90 percent of our time indoors which we shouldn't be, we should be spending, you know, it should be the other way around. We should spend 10% of our time indoors and 90% outside, but we basically created a culture mm. where everything is to be inside. So we've got 90% of our time indoors, which is one, not only harming kind of our health, but also our mental health. It's not working with our natural circadian rhythm, which is kind of our sleep-wake cycle, which is really important. So it means that we're not getting the best night's sleep. 
we've got distractions all the time so like even now my podcast you know I've, my phone was on silent everything was shut down but somehow calls are still coming in on my computer and it's you like see them. pushing off yes yeah and I you know yeah. I'm like declining them <laughs> and we're constantly like bombarded right all the time so we live in this state of like shock and anxiety and we know that like when we get a message it hits our dopamine levels but mm -hmm. for some reason we live in this constant state of a cortisol release because of this basically the environment that we've like endured and we and we only want more it's only going to become more excessive with AI and mm everything else that we've got going on it's only going to come more and more excessive on you know the the consistency of disturbances that we get and so you know we try to look at focus time with our mental health it's so hard for people to focus and there's yes. all this conversation around ADHD and yes a lot of people will start relating to ADHD symptoms they might have ADHD because it might be the first time they've heard about it or they might just be really struggling with focus because our environment is literally driven completely away from focusing it's yeah. really driven away even like working in our homes it's really hard to focus we're not changing our environment and that's one of the biggest things yeah. so there's so many different like factors on why our mental health is struggling and then you look at like our diet and our nutrition two-thirds of our shopping baskets are full of ultra processed foods not just processed foods ultra processed foods and so again we're not fueling our bodies and we're not fueling our minds and when we look at our gut microbiome 90 percent of like our neuromodulators which are like our feel-good hormones and our happy hormones are fed to our brain. So we're feeding our our brain basically just like sugar and empty calories and none of that is like proper fuel. It's mm -hmm. like putting the wrong fuel in the car. It's like trying to charge an electric car with like basically diesel. It's just not going to go anywhere. And that's how we're trying to basically see our bodies. And so we're not refueling them correctly. So that's again, putting a lot of kind of stress onto our brain because we're not, we're not nourishing it correctly. Mm -hmm. So there's so many different things. And then you look at like the pressures of work, relationships, all of these things compounded together um, really, really impact our mental health. And so something that I'm very passionate about, and you, and you mentioned the seven pillars, but I always feel, and I still feel to this day, that people really isolate a factor of health and they drive at it and they're really passionate about it. And I love the passion, but it's, it's so linear yes. and it's like, you can't just determine a mental health outcome or a diet outcome or whatever that it, a happiness outcome, whatever you're trying to like measure from one thing, one common denominator, they all interplay. And you could be having, you know, you could do everything by the book. You could have the best diet. You could have the best exercise routine. You could have every single box ticked, but if your environment's not right, or you're, you know, or you're not giving yourself enough time, or you're not like actually enjoying what you do, all of these things, into play or if you're so heavily stressed even though your diet's perfect your nutrition's perfect your sleep's perfect but your stress is off the chart it's just going to be impacting you just as much so it's really important to like understand the kind of interlink between all of these factors and the the first place I always say is like start with your environment mm. because all of these different things that we talk about all of our different pillars of health even sleep if our environment is not set up to support that you're adding like another friction to that behavior and it's so hard for you to do it and we know how hard it is to ingrain a habit yes. like a lot of us think about how hard is it to ingrain a habit we all know we floss yeah. we probably don't floss because it's not become a habit and so it's like what can we do to reduce that friction to it becoming a normalized habit trying to go to bed earlier we all know that but we don't do it and what yeah. is the friction that's stopping it is it the amount of phones is that we know we've got access we can put the tv on at any point can we have apps that shut our phone down so we actually can't go on our phone even if we try to go on it we can't mm -hmm. open these apps like what is it that we can start to do to start improving our health behaviors and and the first kind of common denominator in all of it is is our environment yeah. um and because we put a lot of pressure and shame on ourselves sadly we kind of just try to jump straight in at the deep end without taking like the steps to help those health behaviors become a bit easier and that overall basically will support our mental health but it's a it's a really multifactorial conversation that I think is had in in a very linear structure mm -hmm. and I think that's where we're really going wrong mm -hmm. um in terms of this so so yeah, it's one that I can speak about for yeah. a very long time. And, and I'd love to, I'd love it if you would, but unfortunately <laughs> we're constrained by time, time but, I'd, I'd, but I'd love to one day. But, um, you know, I, I think it's also important to know that, um, you know, just meeting yourself where you're at. So like you said, um, like you just alluded to, 
um, having, you know, being realistic and, and kind of changing your environment in small ways. So even um, my husband recently, I'm very proud of him, he downloaded an app called Opus. And that shuts down your um, social media between certain hours. Brilliant. And I just think just that small little change, um, obviously, is something that he needs. And I just think it's so it's so important because when you speak about our lack of focus, I couldn't agree more. Um, I even think that, you know, people I mean, for example, a friend of mine not too long ago said, I think I have ADHD. And I was like, really, you? Like, I, I never would have thought that, like, you, you always have quite good attention. Um, but it did cross my mind. I was like, you know, is it the the fact that we're so distracted that we actually believe, that, oh, my God, I can't focus? You know, I even do it myself. You know, I'm so distracted by my phone, by my, um, you know, by my emails and by my kids and um, all of the to do lists and things I need to do that sometimes I feel like I'm going crazy. <laughs> And that mm. I'm losing it. I'm just like, you know, mm -hmm. I, I can't focus. I can't get anything done. And I, you know, all this negative self-talk, which we know is is not a good thing. Um, so I think that is, like you said, that is a massive, massive part of it as well. The fact that we have mm. access to so much um, with everything that's going on in the world at the moment, it's absolutely devastating. And mm. that's affecting us as well. And, you know, sometimes I think, you know, as humans, are we just designed to know about our neighbors? <laughs> Are we designed to know about our families, our friends, maybe the tribe next door? Is that what our physiology is designed for, really? But in fact, we're exposed to the world. You know, we, we're taking on the, the world's problems. And sometimes I think, you know, that also causes a lot of anxiety, stress and, and issues, you know, mental health problems. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really interesting topic that, um, you know, is, it's quite a long one, but, um, what I wanted to do is to kind of, you know, because you're a nutritionist and you give loads of great, um, tips on, on nutrition and how that links to mental health. First of all, I mean, obviously coming from the modeling industry, um, you've been around a lot of dieting. So um, low mm. calorie diets, maybe even people trying different diets like keto and veganism and all of these things. So what are your takes on diets like keto, veganism, paleo? Like if someone says to you, Sarah, like I'm thinking of doing the keto, what do you think? Like, what are your thoughts on these diets? So my thoughts on diets will stop at that they don't work right. um, and they don't make you happy. Um, and, you know, I grew up in the nineties where it was like the calorie era, you know, mm. the weight watches, the slimming world, whatever that awful thing was called. And I just hate them. Mm. Um, and that's a strong word, but I really don't like them because it basically makes food become unenjoyable. And I think the epicenter of food needs to be enjoyment. One of the biggest kind of factors of health is like, happiness and enjoyment and joy and laughter and food is there to be shared culturally it's there to be shared socially um it's there to bring enjoyment so that's one of the biggest things diets kind of take the fun out of it and I think we're not around for very long we need to be enjoying what we're eating um and I love food like I'm a nutritionist but I really love food and if someone tries to restrict that I'm not a happy person so first of all like I always say like that any diet I don't think should be followed I think you should a lifestyle change is the one that I always advocate for and then like you've mentioned kind of a range of diets there so or kind of lifestyle changes such as veganism or keto or paleo or you know carnival there's so many different ones out there and I think we went through a massive trend about eight years ago where these were kind of really at the epicenter like people were really you know low carb high carb you know, what, 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 what camp were you in? And everyone had a camp and it was kind of like this label that we gave to ourselves. And we were kind of in, if we were in that camp, we were accepted and we were against one another. The one thing that like all of these diets try to advocate is whole food mm. and I'm all for whole food. So I think, you know, if you're trying to change your diet and you're including more whole foods, which is not processed within your diet, then I think that is an amazing start. But sadly, a lot of these diets are really, really limiting. Um, and I've had this conversation quite a lot on the show recently, but I speak about this and I do write about this a lot. You know, I would love people to make a transition more just towards eating real food, 
just real food. And it sounds so stupid to say, but like, I'd probably say to the listeners, like try and think back through your last kind of 48 hours. How many pieces of like whole grown food did you eat? And how many pieces of like processed food did you eat? And just even thinking about that, I mean, somebody might be like, well, it was 100%. I mean, you are doing way better than most of the percent of the nation. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the biggest things. That's what these diets do advocate. But along with these diets, they also do obviously have a massive mix of processed foods. When veganism became quite big, it was, you know, there was like vegan Jaffa cakes. Mm -hmm. That's not healthy. That's not what kind of like plant-based food advocates. It's not veganism. That's just processed food without meat in it or without gelatin in it you know it's it's not veganism it's just because it's not got milk in it doesn't mean it's not healthy Mm -hmm. same thing happened with gluten-free you were still eating the same amount of processed food whether it's a gluten-free bread or wholemeal bread I mean a Mm wholemeal bread is way healthier for you so with these diets I'm definitely not against the whole food but I'm very much against the kind of isolated form of them because I think it really starts to cut out major food groups unless you need to or unless you believe it for ethical reasons. But if you're looking at something like the carnivore diet, that is, or the paleo diet, that is so heavy in meat, so heavy in protein, you're really missing out on like the fundamentals of fruits and vegetables. And in the paleo diet, you can get that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the carnivore diet is so heavily rooted in meat and it's actually gonna completely mess up your gut microbiome. You've got no fiber in there. We know that's like one of the key things for our gut microbiome and for our brain health. So, I kind of say when anyone's looking at these range of diets and there are so many, like there's the fructarian diet where people live on fruit and somebody actually sadly passed away from that recently. There's so many diets out there. And I kind of think if anyone is advocating the word diet in anything, Mm. just take a step back because if you take the word tea off, what does that spell? Die. Mm. Right? So Mm. like, it's not like, we're not wanting to advocate that. What we're really wanting to do is like, one, I really want you to think about how you're eating doesn't make you happy. Yes or no. Does it give you energy? Yes or no. That's like one of the biggest factors. Mm. And a lot of people will say they've got an energy change when they changed these diets. The reason why they're getting an energy change is because they're cutting out a lot of processed foods. It's not okay. because of the food that they're eating. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that's like one of the biggest things. And then people go, oh, okay, well, I feel really great. I'm going to keep on eating this, but we don't want to restrict ourselves too much. And I think a big thing that I see when we do really restrict ourselves, and I saw this from the modeling world, and I see this from patients that walk through my door every week, is that like we're always trying to optimize our diet, but taking out those foods makes it even harder. You're not getting the right nutrients. You're not getting kind of the right mixture of nutrients that you need. And so what we really want to be doing is the biggest way that you can improve your health is looking at diversity, Mm -hmm. diversity of like whole real foods. How many different types of varieties of foods can you get into your diet? And that's when you're absolutely smashing like your health and your optimization of nutrition. Um, But what we've sadly done is really isolated it and tried to label it. And it's become a very odd industry. I really have seen like the wellness industry become very parallel to the fashion Mm. where there's like these groups of kind of different trends that always pop up. And if you're, you're really advocating for one trend and someone else is really advocating for another and it can become very like, quite like a war zone in these moments yeah and it's like actually like let's just take different parts of these diets they're all surrounded with whole foods that's great that's the number one step but we don't want to be removing too many foods um and so I think that's one of the biggest things is like diversity I think is key and making sure that it's not restrictive making Mm -hmm. sure that you're enjoying it um are the kind of the two big things I think to to nutrition to kind of where to start off from I think in a world where we're trying to get attention, so Mm. you get more attention, the more negative or the more forceful you are. So if someone, for example, is promoting a certain diet, let's say the carnivore diet, um, the more forceful they are, the more they bring down the idea of eating vegetables and the more they um, push that narrative that they they get more attention they get more followers they get um you know their book deals and you know that it and and that is a massive part of it as well like you know the the pushing of the trends is not so much rooted in the diet itself it's kind of rooted in this um desire to marketing exactly and like you said that really interesting parallel between the food industry and fashion that's a really interesting um kind of 
correlation I've never thought of it that way but it's like trends and it's it's really aggressive opposing forces and you know the consumers are kind of in the middle like wondering where they what's belong going on yeah what's going on and, and health doesn't need to be as complicated as it, as it mm. is and I think we've made it so complicated one not just from the choices that we have on offer which I don't really think we have much choice you know like most of our supermarkets are full of processed foods so mm. we go in it's very hard to make an easy choice because majority of the foods on offer are processed um, and then we have this like mislabeling health trends going on everywhere and we kind of feel like we need to go to a group mm. um, and actually we don't need to go to a group it shouldn't be complicated it shouldn't be expensive um, and what I'll say to anyone who's advocating a diet very strongly mm. is you will be able to find a piece of evidence in anything that you want I could find a piece of evidence on anything and shout about it um, and that's one of the that's one of the worst parts of science is that mm. actually there is evidence for a lot of things, but they're all conflicting. And what people want to be looking at, which is something called a meta analysis, we want to be looking at like a whole abundance of trials that are random controlled. And if they're significant, if there's a correlation, most people kind of look at small studies done in done in animals, done in mice, or something that's observational, like epidemiological research, which kind of looks over people over a long period of time that doesn't have a causation it's more of an association so we don't know there's a direct impact from that one health behavior and you know that's the thing about science and a lot of the documentaries that are on netflix that kind of scare people off certain things is because they're pulling out these like cherry picked pieces of bad science and then feeding them to everybody in a way that makes it look really impressive mm -hmm. and so it's all about like kind of questioning this mm -hmm. and actually saying does this make me happy do mm. I want to be restrictive? Do I want to live solely off like meat? Mm. Probably not. No. Um, and actually, we do know that like the general health guidance, plant food is amazing for us. Mm. Not just living on plant food alone. You know, it does. It is very restrictive. Um, but I'm also not fully against someone being vegan. Mm -hmm. I just think as long as people are trying to put as much diversity in their diet as possible, then they're doing really, really well. Yeah. I say the first step is just step away from those processed foods, but we sadly live in an environment where it's so difficult to do no, right and I have to agree with all of my podcasts that I've done and all of the different views um very strong views as well um that people have had about food there is that correlation in whole food and just finding the best quality you can and just you know just starting with that so I've also found the same thing um but you base a lot of your research around omega-3s. So what do we need to know about them? Oh my gosh, love them. So the reason why I got into omega-3s, and I can tell you the back kind of story, and that will lead on to why they're so important, mm -hmm. is when I basically got pulled aside from my biochemistry teacher, who said, I think you're dyslexic. And I thought, have I got to 24 and never realized I'm dyslexic? How has that happened? And obviously had all the tests and they said, yes. When you kind of come to your dissertation, this is when I kind of first started going into nutrition. All I remember is sitting in this lecture about omega-3 and them saying, oh, there's, you know, there's some correlations or associations actually with, um, you know, our mental health and our brain health. And, you know, there's some questioning around dyslexia and ADHD. And obviously I was dyslexic. And all mm -hmm. I wanted to know since I had dyslexia is how can I support my dyslexia? So I figured out about my visual cues I figured out that I'm like, but not very good at reading, but I can listen back to them and I'll kind of um, disseminate them better. And then I can put them into brainstorms and all that kind of thing. And I thought, okay, but I always wanted to know, like, how can I support myself more? Because obviously my, my mind is, is, is slightly different to others. And hearing that was like something that went off in my mind. And I was like, what do you mean this could help support my brain? What do you mean this could help support my learning? Because obviously I struggled so much in those lectures. And so then I started following, um, a really amazing professor in Oxford who'd done a lot of trials around dyslexia, autism, ADHD, and omega-3. I found really, really impressive results. And so I would go and watch her speak. I'd go and read her research trials. There was a lot of people pioneering the space in America. And the more that I read about the importance of omega-3, the more I was wanting to consume fish or the more that I was wanting to look at, like, what are the levels that we do in omega-3? What does this mean? How can I trial it on myself? And then my whole dissertation became around this one topic. And that just then led me, started me down that very like wiggly road of now I'm obsessed with this topic and I need to know more. So 
little, 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 little many years later, 10 years later, I'm still here obsessing around omega-3s. And the reason why is because, you know, a lot of the research within neurodivergent brains is that actually most of us are below our omega-3 recommended levels anyway. Yes. And when we actually give children oily fish that struggle with reading and writing, um, they actually can overtake their chronological reading age in the short of six months which was really fascinating. I was like, wow, this has a direct impact on kids learning, just consuming oily fish. How, why? Well, a third of our cell membranes, if you think about this as actually as like a, a, a bricked wall and every third brick is one of your omega-3 fatty acids. Mm -hmm. They need to be replaced mm -hmm. quite, quite frequently. Now, if you're not consuming oily fish, which has these levels of DHA, this kind of third brick that we're speaking about, the house is really clever and it will just go and get something else from the outside, maybe like a stone and, and place it in there. And that's like looking at another type of fat, like cholesterol, that's much more rigid. And it will just place it in that cell membrane. And what happens is it starts to become not as structured. And so when we have like a big storm, it will blow that house down. And that's how you think about stress. When stress comes in, it will blow mm -hmm. down that cell membrane quite quickly. It's not going to be as structured and held together. And so what's really, really important is that within our brain health, even if you're not neurodivergent, making sure we're replenishing a third of that membrane with DHA, which is that omega-3 fatty acid, is really, really, really critical. So it's not using these other types of fat. So it actually is going to be way more weathered and better for the storm. Mm. So I talk a lot about omega-3 fatty acids um, in relation to cognitive functioning, in relation to brain health, in relation to neurodivergent brains. But just overall, omega-3 is also really, really important for anti-inflammatory reasons. A lot of our diet is very pro-inflammatory. Um, and that's obviously what we don't want to be causing within our bodies because we know inflammation is like the number one thing that leads to chronic disease. It's the number one thing that starts kind of mutations within our cells. So what we want to be doing is try to be having more anti-inflammatory foods. And omega-3 is an, is an anti-inflammatory food as well. So for me, I speak about it a lot in brain health, but just overall general health, it's really, really important. But sadly, we have a very high um, high intake of kind of inflammatory foods within our diet, which are kind of ultra processed foods. Yeah. Um, and so we need to be having more of these anti-inflammatory ones just for general health. But for brain health, they are critical. Um, so having at least one portion of oily fish a week is recommended. Um, but if not, try to have two, unless you're pregnant, stay towards yeah. the one portion. But um, a few portions of oily fish as well, I try to advocate for. And what would you recommend for somebody who doesn't like oily fish? Would yeah, you recommend so supplementation? this is a question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you have to be really careful where you get your supplements from, because there's so many on the market that are actually just full of a very limited amount of EPA, DHA. And I've done a lot of research mm -hmm. on this recently. But actually, like, you know, even when you're looking at studies and you're trying to look at supplement trials, um, you always see the ones where oily fish is used as um, the predictor of health or the ones that they're trying to um, measure. You normally get really good, strong, significant results from the ones with oily fish. The supplements can be a bit mixed. And I honestly believe there's, they don't use one supplement through all the trials. Obviously, they're just grabbing an omega-3 supplement. And every supplement has such different levels of DHA and EPA. Um, so it's really important to be looking at those levels and, and understanding that you've got a good amount of it. It's not full of bulking agents. They've actually got most of the supplement. You want 90% of the supplement to be made of EPA and DHA. Um, but if you don't like oily fish or you're a vegan and you're a plant-based and you just don't want to even take an oily fish supplement and my mum can't take an oily fish supplement because it makes her feel quite sick yeah, yeah, um, same with how my these yeah. yeah she just swallowing big tablets she's like Ugh. but anything with oily fish is like no I can't I just can't do it um is basically how the oily fish get these levels these DHA and these EPA these longer chain fatty acids that we've just spoke about is through the algae so the fish eat the algae and then that's how they absorb those levels of epa and dha and so when you consume it that's why you gain them so you can also get an algae supplement um which contains as many as the epa and dha levels as oily fish if not more um and they're plant-based so if you don't like the taste of oily fish or you just don't want to consume it um then go for an algae supplement um because you'll get the same levels so just make sure that you're looking at epa and dha yeah. a lot of people when they look for omega-3 will go oh there's these walnuts and there's these chia seeds and all these kind of plant-based compounds that have omega-3 but they're the short chain acids and 
the um the transition into these longer chains is so 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 low that you have to eat more than enough abundance mm-hmm. that you would normally just consume to get these bigger levels it's basically physically impossible it's how we kind of look at like the the vitamin d that we get from the sun it's really hard to consume the same amount in our food and it's the same with these shorter chains of omega-3 so to basically make sure that you're gaining them you either need to take a supplement or mm-hmm. eat oily fish um but yeah so, so it's definitely one of my like non-negotiables of how and and so it should be um epa and dha so that is the they are the key terms that's what people should be looking for if they're going to be um, yes. going to supplements so um what i wanted to basically um round up the um, interview with because i know that you have another podcast to go on to so you're a busy woman um but just just two questions really and they they can kind of meld into one actually with so back back to yourself um with the weight of being a role model for so many young people how do you take care of your mental health and who are your role models oh that's a good one um how do I so I have quite strong boundaries mm, um oh, that's good I need and some that's of those definitely Give me some of those yeah <laughs> we all need those boundaries yeah. and there's I've had to kind of learn them the hard way mm-hmm. um and people don't speak about boundaries at all um and people think about that as feeling very like structured and rigid but there's just a lot of things where I know where my boundary sits with mm-hmm maybe not so much with work. That's probably one I really need to work on a lot more. Um, But boundaries in my self-care. So there's a lot of things that I'll make sure that within a day, like I always check in to see how I feel. And I think a lot of us have become very dissociated from our bodies um, and we kind of lose track of how we feel. And then we just kind of go on this hamster wheel. So for me, it's about like checking in with how I feel. I have really strong boundaries through my day. You know, I'm not I never want to let people down, but I'm also very aware of like making sure actually I do put myself first, which for a very, very, very long time, I never did. And the only person who suffered was me. So making sure I have really strong boundaries and I'm just really, I'm very communicative around them. You know, they're not kind of a, I'm not going to do this because of X. Like I'm very aware and I'm very empathetic of other people's time, but making sure I've got those boundaries so I won't overbook myself where I know I can let people down. So that's a really mm-hmm. big kind of key thing for my mental health is making sure I've got enough time for me, making sure I've got those boundaries put in place to do that. Um and that isn't being able to like take three hours for myself a day, but it's knowing that I actually will have some downtime at some point. Um and that's really, really key. And I won't put anything in my diary before 10 o'clock in the morning. It mm-hmm. just doesn't go in. Mm-hmm. Um because that's a boundary where if there's things I need to do or catch up on or exercise, I've got an hour in my day just to actually basically do that. And that is my one non-negotiable. Um, so that's the way, something like how I look after my mental health. I also really try to, as much as I can, really focus on the food that I consume just because I'm so passionate and all of my research is in that area. Mm-hmm. So I'm very aware of the food that I'm eating. If I can, I would always try to be prepared so I do like a weekly shop and that's something that I always have within my basket um because everyone is so the one thing we don't have is time every single person in this world is time poor yeah the the most valuable asset we have is time and so I try to structure everything to give me more time and so one of the things that really causes me stress is if I'm trying to do too many things last minute yeah and it's definitely something that I've learned through dyslexia is that routine is really really important mm. so having structure in place for me is really key for my mental health as soon as I don't have structure my mental health goes out the window and I just feel like I'm running 30 miles per hour and I actually make so many mistakes so for mm-hmm. me like structure and routine is really important and um and my boundaries are kind of the main things that I do and then lastly it's movement so whether it's like going on a walk or whether it's like just going outside and getting fresh air and moving my body um it doesn't have to be like an intense work class um workout class which I don't actually do that often I'll mm-hmm. go for a run I'll do a bit of yoga but it's actually just moving my body um is one of kind of my key non-negotiables for mental health because I know it makes me feel really 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 good um, and it just allows my brain from all of that stuff we spoke about in the beginning where it's constantly bombarded. Mm-hmm. It's actually the one time where I step away from all of that and I've just got everything to kind of process. Yeah. And I don't think many times that we actually think, how do we process everything that's come through our brain in that day? Mm-hmm. And so that is my kind of form of processing. I have half an hour away from my phone 
and I might be in yoga, I might be on a run, I might literally go and walk and get a coffee. Yeah. That's kind of my movement to kind of process my mind and, and move my body. So they're they're kind of the three things that I try to really do to and, support my mental and health. Just, and just to kind of cut in there, um, I couldn't agree more when it comes to time because I, um, when it comes to when I pick my daughter up from school <clears throat> and she comes home, that's when I know, <clears throat> that's when I know that it's time with the kids. And before I didn't really understand that. I thought, no, when the kids come home, I've still got work to do. And mixing kids with work really is yeah. enough to like make my brain explode. Like, I, th- yeah. I think any anybody could see that. Um, so uh, very recently, actually, I made a decision, like a very strong decision that when the kids come home from school, that's it. It's about them. And there's no work yeah. happening, like regardless. And actually, when you make that decision, it, everything falls into place and suddenly the work can wait and suddenly you can do more work in the morning and like it's just about making that decision that you're going to put yourself first however that looks that's the strongest part that's what needs to be done um but it's true it's like letting yeah. go it's giving yourself yeah. that kind of what's the word that I'm looking for not the response it's giving yourself not the release like it's allowing yourself to say mm. I'm actually not going to do that because I don't think we ever we're like we've got to do all these things we've got to do everything and actually allowing yourself just to say do you know what I'm not the world's not going to end mm. the world is simply not going to end if I don't do that thing it all of a sudden just lets you let go and it kind of gives you that freedom to step away oh, and then you realize actually like how important was that I was stressing out my kids I was stressing out myself my yeah. work wasn't actually that great yeah we feel this need to be constantly busy that's yes. the pressure that I think we all feel oh god the need to be constantly busy totally I, I really feel that too um but I'm curious who are your role models I mean David Attenborough in my brain mm. is quite an amazing role model he's also somebody who's really unpushy mm. he's not someone who's you know he's really trying to he's been he's been campaigning for obviously climate change for so long for so many years mm. He's someone that I think everyone loves. I think if you say his name, I don't think I've ever, ever heard, sorry, say that again so you can cut that bit out. I don't think I've heard anyone say a bad word about David Attenborough. Yeah, yeah. It's, he seems to have this amazing aura about him that he's campaigning for such an important, important yes. right and change within this world because it's not going to be here if we don't. Yeah. But he does it in this amazing way, in a storytelling way, mm-hmm. in a way that basically makes everyone feel that they can do something to change this environment, to change climate change. And I think he's been doing it for so long and he's stuck to his passion, he's stuck to his purpose. And he's kind of, he's found his icky guy, which I think is really inspirational. I don't think many of us do find our icky guy, which is like kind of our purpose for life. Yeah. And that could be anything. It could be the purpose for life is to be an amazing mother. That could be your icky guy. And living that out properly and fully is so inspiring. Yeah. And you know, David Attenborough found that from such a young age. 